Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to the series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one I'm going to be covering three different monster manuals full of monsters that you can add into your game. These are all really, really cool. They are not all system neutral, the first book is, but the other two are not. But the ideas in all three are awesome. The artwork in all three are just, it's just incredible. And I find when I'm adding creatures into my game, the problem isn't adapting monsters to my system. That's usually not a problem. It's pretty easy. The trick is coming up with ideas for monsters. I mean, things that the players haven't seen before, things that are more creative than I would be, things that get me out of a creative rut. These monster manuals will help you do that, at least the first two. And the third one, I think, is a great re-examination of a lot of classic monsters and ideas from old school D&D. Uh, &D. So the first one I'm going to be covering is Vindal the Vagabond's Beastie Almanac, Volume 1. The second one is Vesson, Spirits and Monsters of Mythic Ukraine. And the third is Malevolent and Benign, a first edition bestiary. This is volume one. There is a second, Malevolent and Benign. But the first one is the one I'm going to be covering today. Now, these are all different. So the first one is Pay What You Want, Vindal the Vagabond's Beastie Almanac, volume one. Two. Pay What You Want over on um, Ichio. Vesson is just free. It's not even Pay What You Want. It's just free over on Drive Through RPG. And then Malevolent and Benign is, I think, $10 in PDF form. This one's 130 pages. You can get it in print for 20 bucks, but I think the PDF is, is great. And for $10, you know, you're getting quite a lot on there. Well, let's go through the Beastie Almanac Volume 1 first. Now, this was made by Jamie Douglas, who did Exton, which I've reviewed before. Exton is awesome, and this is no different. It's only 20 pages, but the monsters in here are just really, really great. So you have, Know ye that I am Vindal, and I have traipsed every inch of these accursed lands. You may not have heard of me, but read this manual and learn it well, for it is true what they say. A hundred fools die miserably each day for want of wisdom such as this. A great little introduction. And then you get the creatures in this book. The Bone Lark. Fast gliders with piercing shrieks, fragile bodies, clumsy on the ground, powerful leech-like mouths can quickly crunch bones to suck marrow and blood before they foot off out of harm's way. So it's a little bit like a sturge, but it's an interesting sturge, right? Rather than just the regular sturges that are, you know, probuscus coming down to bite you, there's these things with these bony wings and a spined tail that are going to attach themselves to you and try to, you know, leech you. So good. So good. Bone Lark. Um, with piercing shrieks. A really cool creature. No stats given whatsoever, just up to you to figure out how to use this in your game. Then you have the Flembry. Meddlesome rubbery humanoids that can modify their form and pro proportionate will, ranging from the size of an apple to that of a small dog, should not by any means be swallowed before thorough chewing. Um, consistence of taffy. <laughs> so do not swallow them until you have chewed them thoroughly. You have the Snurgies, the Thortles, the Nettlehawks, the Dugors, the Norwogs, the Shrouded Watcher. Couldn't really read that because of the fancy lettering, but I get it. Shrouded Watcher. The Pylops. What are these? I do not know, but they are best avoided. <laughs> I love that. Great artwork. Silly artwork, but so well done. And, and of a very particular tone. Heclodon. Slorks. Roaches. Ippets. Tunnel chickens, quadrites, pearly slime, vargulis. These ones are nasty. Larvae attached to host's head, attempting to hide beneath hair, hat, or helm. Vargulis most often attached to sentient creatures, but have been known to infect livestock and wild beasts. Hosts feel no pain, but begin to exhibit behavior changes and lethargy. Over time, they become unresponsive, and in due course, the varguli will hatch into its adult form. Wings sprout from the host's ears, I core bursts forth and the head detaches and flies about. It will utter horrible insults, perform vile pranks, and bite anyone it can. That's a horrific creature. Great to have into your game. If, uh, if you had a very particular tone of, of adventure, I think. Yeah, here they are. Sort of like the preludes to the you know, flying skulls or whatever. Floating skulls. Flaming skulls, is what I'm looking for. The Grugadrox. Solitary hunters in desolate mountainous regions. Fernicanths. The Derantropoids. Dicrantopoids? I don't know how to say that, or even how to read that, really, but you could do it yourself. And then, that's it. Being a faithful facsimile of the original text, with the uh, suggested price on the back, as this is a scanned document. Vindal the Vagabond's Beastie Almanac Volume 1. Now, as far as I know, there is only Volume 1. Just pay what you want. So, it's a great little document. Go through it, pick up some monsters, 
and add them into your game. I really like this. Uh, books like this, booklets like this. I wish people made more of things like this. Just small, quick monster manuals, adventures, ideas. Throw it out there for people to, to use. Now, Vesson, Spirits and Monsters of Mythic Ukraine. This one's 74 pages. As I said, it's free on Drive-Thru RPG. I think it was uh, put out there for, you know, to raise awareness, and there's a link to like a donations page for Ukrainian charities and things like that. But the book itself is totally free. And it's free league, so you know the quality is going to be quite high. The art in this book is excellent. Absolutely excellent. And what you get is a bunch of spirits and monsters of Mythic Ukraine. So basically a bunch of folklore from Ukraine. And the creatures in here are the artwork for each creature. It's in a different style for each monster. Some of them are by the same artists, obviously, so there's going to be some overlap with certain monsters, but they're all in different styles. And so some of them are probably going to be much more appealing to you than others. And you have them broken down into nature spirits, familiar spirits of the dead, and monsters. Now, if you're familiar with Vesin, you'll know it's kind of like an investigation game where you're, you're trying to go around putting down, you know, sealing away, driving out monsters. And the, the, the stats of the monsters are given in a very particular way. And usually you can't just defeat them. Usually you have to do something special to defeat them. And, and it's really interesting. So this is a really great piece of art, horrifying piece of art for one of the creatures in the book. Um, Charitable Foundations, there it is. Look at the Besdonic. Now this is just one of them. This is of a style that's not my favorite in this book, the artwork, but it's a creepy little creature here. There's a little bit of lore about it, a few paragraphs about what it is, how it how it works. It's characteristics, which are given in Vesson's stat terms, and then it's magical powers. These are fairly easy to adapt to your game of choice. And then you have conditions that it can inflict, the ritual in order to banish it, and then it's combat abilities. And examples of conflicts with a secret. Before burying Bezdonek, a person who truly believes in God must pray for his soul in church in order to fully seal it away. That's the only way to do it. That's so cool. So there's a creature, there's a bunch of conflicts, there's a ritual to beat it, and then there's a secret about it. And you see this with every creature in the book, the Bonica. Creepy, creepy, creepy piece of art there. The baby's holding a skull. Um, the Bolatianic. The Brodnistia. The Chort. And again, these, these monsters are so flavorful. The ritual. Chorts are sensitive to Christian symbols, terrified of icons, church bells, and crucifixes. If you sprinkle them with Jordan water, they will lose their ability to transform. Chorts also fear wolves and always freeze when they hear their howling. So, you know, if you're putting in a system of your choice, you'd change that to any holy symbol or a particular church or something like that. But it would work super well. And then the secret is, although Chort is cunning, he is trusting and always keeps his promises, so he may be tricked or outsmarted. Also, a shot from a pistol loaded with bread kills Chort instantly. Great idea! Right? I mean, there's everything in this has things like that. The Chuhaister, creepy creature there. If one puts the axe in front of Chuhaister with the edge up and invites him to sit, he will not be able to refuse. Thus, the person can hold him and ask him about the future or favor. Now, some of the language is, it's obviously translation, so sometimes it's not excellent, but mostly it's clear enough that you can read it. The Kovanets, the Kuka, the Koloverti, Krinistia, Lizovic. That's a great piece right there. That wolf is so creepy. The Liko. I like this one a lot too. Mavka. These ladies are creepy. They're beautiful, but then you turn around and you see their spine. Uh, skeletal spines. These ones are really good too. I don't know how to say that. The Nichinistia. Nichinistia. Pashinik. Uh, Paralesnik. These guys are creepy. They come to someone who's had a very serious tragedy and they just drain them slowly of their life and their will and their hope and everything and they pretend to offer them those things and then they just slowly but surely drain them and then leave once they're dead. Really creepy. The Peshilov. Like a werewolf thing. Pidminok. Creepy little baby. Poludnistia. Povetrulia. Skarbnik. This is one of those things where, right, you bring one of these out and it, it's going to be a completely unique creature. Your players are going to have no idea what this thing is. Ugh, terrifying. It's going to be completely bizarre. And the players are going to have no idea how to deal with it at first. And that's the end of the book. Let me go back to one because I thought it was such a cool, cool idea and I skipped right over it. Um, which one is it? Uh, this guy, the Lyco. So I'm going to read through the entire entry because it's so good and it's so creepy. 
So, my journey took me to Markivka, where things were going very badly. First, all the cattle in the village died of a strange disease. Then pests came to the fields and destroyed almost all the wheat. And the mill of one of the local farmers burned down with the farmer inside. People continue to fall into despair. Some just leave their homes at night and disappear. The locals said that everything started last winter with the death of their beloved priest who fell through the ice. All these misfortunes must be connected. The whole village could not be cured, cursed for no reason. There are too many coincidences. Someone must have woken up Lyko or Lyko. No one knows where Lyko, misfortune or calamity, comes from. Whether it is people who create the spirit of misfortune, trouble and grief, or he brings it to people. Lyko usually lives in abandoned mills and huts where it sleeps on a bed of human and animal bones. The first sign that Lyko settled nearby is the arrival of its servants and heralds, the Zlidni, who begin to bring misfortune to everyone around them. Eyewitnesses described Lyko as a thin woman with one eye in the middle of her forehead. With this eye, she could see during the day and night and even through walls. Lyko sleeps most of the time and that it is better not to wake it up. The Lyko likes to eat human and animal meat. With magic and tricks, it lures its prey, which has almost lost the will to live due to misfortune, to quiet, abandoned places. There, it treats the guests with delicacies, gives them delicious drinks, and offers them comfort and coziness, which the victim was deprived of because of Zlidni and curses of Lyko. And when the guest falls asleep, it eats them. With each victim and missing person, Lyko grows until it becomes as tall as a tree. Then it stops hiding, and the one-eyed clumsy giant man-eater attacks the desperate village, devouring everyone. When no more people are left, he goes back into hibernation until someone wakes up Lyko again. That's such a cool monster. And it has this built-in progression threat, right? So as the curse is going on, as your adventurers are trying to find it, it's disappearing. People are disappearing. Bad stuff is happening. Curses start to afflict them, and then they finally find it. Or maybe they don't. If they don't figure it out, they don't find out its lair, then it grows to that giant size and attacks the village. And then they have to fight it. And if they don't defeat it, it just eats everything. And if they do, then that's you know, the end. But it's so good. And then it has its magical powers. So its characteristics. It's Midas 7 through 12, I imagine, as it grows, it gets bigger. Body control, 6, magic, 9, manipulation, 10, fear, 1, 2. I don't know what any of those stats mean, because I don't play Vesin, So, But you can kind of get the idea. It's got a, a variable might, so it gets stronger as it gets bigger. And it seems like if it's as tall as Giant at 12, a magic of 9 is probably pretty high. So it's got some magical resistance or power. It's magical powers. Enchant. Animals are born with defects. Christian symbols shatter. Distorts vision. Fog. Plants die. Spread disease. Terrible signs. So you could easily bring those in, right? Um, these are like layer effects, basically. Holy symbols break. Um, it can, you know, get blur on itself at will. It can cast the fog spell. It can cast, you know, blight or something like that. It can cast spread disease or, or inflict disease or something like that. And then curses are lure, night terror, self-loathing, stranger, and twist vision. Those are all interesting, flavorful ideas. You could easily come up with something. Can summon and control Zlidni. Can turn invisible. Can see in darkness and through walls. Has an extra action to grapple an opponent. Gluttony. Plus one might for victim eaten to a max of 12. Eye of Distress, all player characters' skill checks under Lyka's gaze of a minus one and dice pool. Again, you can easily come up with something like that. And Thriving on Misfortunes, roll additional d6 to might checks in combat for each failed skill check under the Eye of Distress. So whenever a player fails, it gets stronger. That's a really cool idea. Has some conditions, has some combats, and then examples of conflicts, rituals, and secrets. I love this. So, examples of conflicts. In Podilia, the village of Markvisti, Ivan and Marika secretly loved each other and chose an abandoned windmill for their meetings. Families against their relationships and marriage. The families were against their relationships and marriage. They accidentally woke up the Lyko at the windmill but didn't tell anyone about it. Unrelated misfortunes happened in the village, which befall almost every family. The local priest wrote a letter to the society asking for help with these disasters. So, in Vesin, you're like an investigation society, right? But you could easily have this just be the adventurers get it. In a village that I'm not even going to try to name, in the village of Kotomilia, someone woke up the Lyko and began to act. It steals and eats cattle, and so is discord among cattlemen who blame each other for their troubles. The whole village is getting poor quickly. And then in another town I'm not going to try to name, uh, a blind banderist fell in love with a girl and he, he met while wandering and offered her to join him. She agreed if he didn't tell anyone about her. With the arrival of Banderst and his mysterious beloved, the village of Ar Avrimvika, Av Av Avramvika, <laughs> sorry, people begin to disappear. So you have a wandering bard who's blind. He can't see the kind of the woman he's with, right? And uh, he falls in love with her. She, he brings her around, but she's not allowed. No one knows. He just says that there's his beloved nearby, and then bad stuff starts to happen. Obviously, he's got a Lyko or a Lyko with him. The secret. The Lyko will avoid houses if the ground near the yard's gate and the path are sprinkled with ash. Also, buckets must be placed under the windows with the opening outward and plates on the windowsill with faces to the yard. Then that Lyko will avoid that house. And then finally, the ritual. The wedding ritual is considered to be the most effective ritual for banishing Lyko. Before the wedding, you need to make a straw effigy of Lyko and put it under the doorstep so that everyone who comes to the wedding walks on the effigy. On the last day of the wedding, the effigy is dragged through the village, then returned to the wedding yard and burned. Right, that's the most effective way to banish this thing. 
That's so flavorful, so awesome. If you're doing a kind of game where you're, like The Witcher, right, where you're going around finding these creatures and, and not just fighting them, although you have stats for a fight with a creature, it sounds like it's really tough, but you could make it a, a combat as well. But if you want to, if you want to build this thing up where this is how to banish it, maybe this is just how to weaken it. If you wanted to still have a big climactic boss fight, you could do these, right? And they're so flavorful. There's so much like folklore. I love that sort of element in my games: folklore, mythology, tradition, superstition. I think it, you know, it just fits with the tone of the games I like, which is kind of like, what if these things were real, right? <laughs> this is the kind of thing that you would run into. Anyway, I just wanted to cover this one in detail because I thought it was so cool. So. There we have Vesin, Spirits and Monsters of Mythic Ukraine. The last one I wanted to cover, as I said, is Malevolent and Benign, a first edition Beastery Volume 1. This is 130 pages, or just about 130 pages, 129. And the art in this book is great. The monsters in this book are solid. Now, these are all old school, but the paragraphs on them, and it is more traditional in its presentation, contain a lot of great information. The artists in this book are great. Peter Mullen, uh, you know, just be, I love, I love the, uh, the artists that we get in here. We got a great forward with credits there at the front and the table of contents with a whole bunch of creatures. Now, some of these are things you'll see elsewhere. Some of these are entirely new. Now, I'm not even going to try to pronounce some of these names as well. But you've got um, a flightless bird of the desert that, unlike most flightless birds, still possesses large wings. It's like a big ostrich with huge wings. The Akulian. They're sort of scorpion men. Then you have... Uh, the Adlovich, Adlovich, small carnivorous plants. Arcanoplasm are thought to be the result of a failed magic experiment. Wizards and sages alike have tried for years to gather complete information on this odd creature. The Astral Web. Astral webs are permanently invisible astral predators that trap prey in their webby bodies, eventually killing them through deprivation. They also bleed over into the prime material plane, where they are visible and look remarkably like simple giant spider silk and normal cobwebs in a long passageway or tunnel. It's an interesting trap or, or you know, a thing to run into. The autumnal mourners. The lingering spirits of the neglected dead, autumnal mourners, appear during the gray mists of autumn. Deprived of a proper funeral, burial, or even commemoration, they now mourn the summer's annual passing and the subsequent death of the tree's falling leaves. So cool. So cool. The Avatar of Famine. The Avmar. The Barathalar. 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 Are wily shaped changes to don the appearance of house cats to infiltrate households. Once since died, they target young children in the home and suffocate them by stealing their breath. Now, that's an old folklore as well, right there. It's really, really creepy. Blackwater Sloth. Or Slough? I think it's Slough. Fabled as the tainted runoff from a foul lake that contains the remains of a perished dark god. Great ideas. The Blessed Ring. To the weary adventurer, the Blessed Ring is a gift from the gods. Although rare, these simple rings are common. The common stone tools can be found scattered throughout the wilderness. They are distinguished from normal mushrooms by their perfect ring pattern on the ground and the odd lack of any plant growth within their circle. Within their circle. Close inspection reveals nothing special about the ring, but if any living creatures lie down within the circle and remain still for five minutes, the ring begins to grow up around it, quickly forming an impenetrable dome of mushrooms roughly ten feet across and five feet high. This dome can comfortably hold four man-sized creatures. Anyone within the dome can rest completely protected from the elements and any marauding predators. After precisely eight hours, the dome recedes, and within one round, only the original ring of mushrooms remains. There is little chance that anyone within the dome may be disturbed as any attempt to attack or harm the dome during these eight hours, whether from inside or outside, earns the offender a spray of powerful acid dealing 2 to 20 points of damage, so 2d10, uh, of damage to a range of 40 feet. It's something of a mixed blessing. If anyone within the circle is evil, the blessing attempts to just digest everything within it by spraying a powerful acid dealing 2d20 damage to every creature inside the dome. So you don't want to enter it if you're, if you're evil. Blessed rings. Super cool, right? You could have this in the forest as a, as a bit of respite for some players. If there's a ranger in the party, you could reward him for, um, you know, if he makes a really high survival check to try to find a safe place to rest, or maybe he finds a blessed ring. And he's like, hey guys, I know this because I'm a ranger. We should camp inside it. And maybe there's a lawful evil character who's like, eh, no, guys, actually, sorry, I think I'll stay outside. You know, whatever you might be. Um, and then there is a variant, a cursed ring, which is the exact opposite. It uh, shelters evil creatures while digesting good ones. And you could, uh, they're indistinguishable from true blessed rings. I don't know if I would do that. Maybe I would make it some way of telling that it's cursed. But anyway, I love the idea. Blight belchers. <laughs> That's awesome. Blood bowlers. Blood worms. Bog beasts. Bog wings. Bone sovereigns. Ooh, that's a good one. Bone sovereigns are really cool looking. They don't turn easily. 
brain lock mold spider. Ugh. I hate spiders. Brine crust. Bull of heaven. Cadavers, canopy krakens, cave hermits. Silid horrors. Ooh, that's a good one. I like that art. Physical description, a silid or kelid, kelid? Horror looks like a mix of crocodile, wolf, and porcupine. It has a crocodilian snout with a, upon a scaled, wolf-like body. Along its back run a long trail of protective spines. Kaled horrors are quite agile. A pack will bay back and forth to one another, sounding much like a pack of bellowing alligators. Ooh, they have pale, luminous green eyes. So alligators, I don't know if I mean, they think they roar, right? Or they hiss, they grumble. I don't know what alligators do. I don't, I don't know if they bellow. Maybe they do. I've never heard of an alligator bellowing, but that's pretty creepy. I'm not sure what that would sound like. Clamor. Coblinos. Dark voyeurs. Dark woodsmans. Dead woods. Oh, creepy. Delusion hummers. Dioctopus. Dragon. Amana Amaaji. You get the point here. Really, really cool, flavorful new creatures for your OSR game. Epicureans. Eralth's Faceless Ones. Ooh, those guys are creepy. I like those. Fool's Dragon. That's awesome. A Fool's Dragon gets its name from its uncanny resemblance to true dragons. So Fool's Dragon, Fool's Gold. Fluttering Oozes. Ooh, Fluttering Oozes. Foul Spawners. Fungal Renders. Furrowers. Ganyadi. Gargoyle. Madsome. Gejin. Ghoul Fruit Tree. A Nephilim Giant. A Rhyme Giant. Sea giant, wood giant, amalgam golem, dragon ship golem. Whoa. A dragon ship golem is an animated sailing vessel. Identical to a long ship in almost every way, its primary function is as a transport that needs no crew. It can be told one destination and it will sail there by the quickest route possible. As a sailing vessel, a dragon ship has room for a crew of 30 and can carry up to 35 tons of cargo. That's so cool, right? So you get a dragon ship golem as a reward for a quest, or maybe it's the object of a quest, and you finally get it, and now you're like, you can sail around. It's so cool. Furnace Golem, Ion Golem, Labyrinthine Golem, Resin Golem, Wax Golem. So good. So just page after page of really awesome creatures. You know, again, I'm only halfway through this book. The Haze Horror. Oh, I love this one. The Hearth Horror. The Ghost of a Dead Place. It's such a cool idea. Horribly corrupted by evil and obsessed with restoring itself to its former glory. Really cool idea. And again, a lot of these ideas, the Heartless, are things that just would be surprising to your players. And we have a lot of creatures from more modern books. Um... We've seen goblins, we've seen orcs, we've seen certain kinds of golems, we've seen certain kinds of oozes, we've seen nagas, but this take on a lot of these kinds of creatures is so good to me. I love it. Really, really do. I highly recommend checking this book out. Now again, it's 10 bucks, but I think it's worth it. I mean, look at the artwork, look at the different kinds of creatures, you're just... I mean, maybe, you know, here's the thing. Maybe it's just me. Maybe I am. <laughs> I don't think it's just me. But I am not that creative when it comes to creating new creatures. Page after page. Really, I mean, it's just kind of incredible. I love these I, uh, these uh, monsters. They're so creative. They're so awesome. This makes me want to get um, number two. Now, I actually got this as part of a Humble Bundle with a whole bunch of adventures. And uh, some of those adventures are awesome, too. I might go through them at some point. But the... Um, the monster manual is just so good. Thus ends this tome with the weird wolf. An appendix of new magic items related to monsters in this tome. So it's not just monsters. You get a bunch of magic items too. And the magic items work with the creatures from this book. Then you get monsters by level, monsters by rarity, monsters by terrain type, and then you get the open gaming license. Along with advanced adventures, these are the adventures that I got. So they're advanced adventures, um, a whole bunch of them, just a ton, a ton, a ton of them in this humble bundle. With a great uh, cover for the first edition, Beastier, you know, reminiscent of, of old school. I like that, that shark with the hammerhead shark with the wings, especially on the right. So Malevolent and Benign, Volume 1, a first edition Beastery. Vesson, Spirits and Monsters of Mythic Ukraine, and Vindel the Vagabonds, Beasties, 
or Beastie Almanac Volume 1. I'll put links below to where you can get them. Again, this one's pay what you want. The Vessen book is free, and Malevolent and Benign is $10. Obviously, these two, the first two, were worth it because they're free. I mean, pay what you want. I think the suggested donation is $10, which seems a little high to me, but, you know, for, ten, for, for 20 pages, the amount of work that went into it, um, I can definitely see why 10 pages, $10 if you can afford it. Is, is good, but you know, not everybody wants to spend 10 bucks for a 20 page document. So I would say, you know, if you use the monsters from this book, at least throw uh, a few dollars uh, his way because definitely deserves to be paid for the, the work in here. But it's still so good. And the monsters in here are great, funny little creatures you can throw into any game. Uh, the other books, just so full of so many good ideas. Anyway, I hope this has been interesting to everybody and I'll see you in another video.